Tonight, breaking news, the urgent manhunt for an escaped prisoner considered armed and dangerous, and the shocking new warrant just issued. Casey White awaiting trial for capital murder, breaking out of an Alabama jail. The prisoner last seen with the assistant director of corrections for the jail. Are they romantically involved? Her car abandoned in a parking lot. The sheriff, who has known that deputy for years, about to join Top Story Live. Why he thinks the 16-year veteran of his own department and a four-time employee of the year was involved in the jailbreak. Twister danger, stunning drone footage showing an EF3 tornado ripping through Kansas. Residents there still picking up the pieces, bracing for another round of storms. We'll have the latest forecast heading into the dangerous night ahead. Plus the tragic death of three young men chasing the storm as college meteorology students. Their family speaking out tonight. Out of control wildfires exploding in New Mexico, burning more than 100,000 acres of land. Thousands forced to evacuate, four million still under alert. Dangerous escape, at least 100 civilians evacuated from a steel plant in Mariupol, hundreds more still trapped inside. But tonight, questions growing. Where will the evacuees be sent? And could they end up back in areas under Russian control? Plus, Amber Heard fighting to save her reputation, firing her PR team as legions of fans side with ex-husband Johnny Depp in their high-profile defamation court battle. The actress set to take the stand this week, but has her fate in the court of public opinion already been sealed? And license to roar, the black bear caught on camera sitting shotgun inside of a truck. How police were finally able to get this unwanted hitchhiker out. Top story starts right now. Hey, good evening. Tonight, an improbable jailbreak rocking a tight-knit community. The Lauderdale County Sheriff's Office in Alabama now facing a series of impossible questions. Why would corrections officer Vicki White, you see her right there, a 16-year veteran of the force and an all-star employee, suddenly decide to break department protocol on the day she was set to retire? Did she have a relationship with inmate Casey White, who was serving a 75-year sentence for multiple crimes and awaiting a capital murder trial? And where are the two of them right now? The prisoner and the guard last seen leaving for a mental health evaluation at the courthouse. The car they were in found abandoned in this parking lot. White's boss, the county sheriff, joining Top Story Live in just moments with the latest on the manhunt. Why he felt compelled to issue an arrest warrant for the officer he knew so well. But we begin first with what we do know. And NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez, who leads us off. She'd been named employee of the year four times, but tonight Alabama corrections officer Vicki White is facing new charges, including permitting or facilitating the escape of an inmate. The arrest warrant comes after investigators say she disappeared Friday from this jail west of Huntsville, along with prisoner Casey White. No relation. I would like to emphasize that this case is now a major case for the United States Marshal Service. Police say Casey White is hard to miss, 6'9", 260 pounds, and that he's often changed his appearance. Here he is just last week as he awaited trial on capital murder charges. He was already serving time for a separate 2015 crime spree that included a home invasion and carjacking. According to authorities, Vicki White falsely claimed she was transporting him from jail to the courthouse for a mental health evaluation. Today, the sheriff said her patrol car was spotted on surveillance video minutes later, nowhere near that courthouse, before being abandoned at this shopping center. This is not the Vicki White we know uh, by any stretch of the imagination. She has been an exemplary employee. The sheriff now says investigators are looking into whether the pair may have been romantically involved or whether she helped him escape for another reason. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us live on set now. So, Gabe, what more do we know about Casey White's criminal history? And he's considered armed and dangerous. Yeah, that's right, Tom. He has a lengthy criminal history. As we mentioned, he was arrested and convicted for that 2015 crime spree. But then he was awaiting trial on uh, capital murder charges. And he had allegedly confessed to that, but later pleaded not guilty. But authorities say that he is likely armed and dangerous because of the possibility that he could have taken this officer's service handgun. All right, armed and dangerous. Gabe Gutierrez, thanks for leading us off tonight here on Top Story. For more on this active manhunt, joining Top Story right now live is Lauderdale County Sheriff Rick Singleton. Sheriff, thank you so much for joining Top Story. I want to start with the new developments. You've issued an arrest warrant for your employee, Vicki White. How do you know for sure she assisted in this escape and was not forced? 
Well, of course, by now we've, we've got all the, a lot of the pieces of the puzzle put together. Uh, Vicki White was the assistant director of operations at the detention center. Part of her responsibility was coordinating transports to the courthouse for inmate appearances. Uh, just moments before uh, she left with Casey White, a second van with two deputies and, and seven inmates uh, departed the detention center for the courthouse. A few minutes before that, the first van departed with two deputies and uh, five inmates. And uh, once that second van left, she went to uh, another correction deputy, told him to bring Casey White uh, to the booking area to prepare him for transport. Uh, the deputy did that put him in handcuffs, put him in leg shackles. Uh, then Vicki White told the booking officer that all the other officers were tied up, that she was the only officer available to transport him to the courthouse, even though as against uh, policy, uh, and that she was going to drop him off here at the courthouse for other deputies to take custody of, and then she was going for a medical appointment because she wasn't feeling well. Uh, obviously, there was no appearance uh, here at the courthouse for him. Uh, the eight-minute time frame from the time she left the detention center, 9.41 a.m., uh, the vehicle was seen on video surveillance at the intersection of Cox Creek Parkway and Huntsford Road, eight minutes later at 8.49, and that's about a mile and a half to two-mile drive, um, and that's about what it would take on normal, normal traffic to make that drive. So that tells us that there was no time for any kind of diversion. Uh, if she had gone one block toward the courthouse and had to divert and go back another way, there's no way she could have been at that intersection in eight minutes. Sheriff, have so you been no able to establish? Now that, Sheriff, excuse me for cutting you off there. Have you been able to establish a romantic relationship between Vicky and this capital murder suspect? We have not uh, confirmed any relationship. When something like this happens uh, in the jailhouse uh, setting. Uh, inmates are coming forth with all kinds of information, uh, and obviously some of that is that there was a relationship. We're certainly pursuing that, looking into it, We're trying to confirm if there was or was not a relationship. So, this Sheriff, just to sure. be clear, just to be clear, you have received information from other inmates that there was a relationship there? We have. Okay. And there seems to be a few other clues Vicki left behind. What can you tell us about her pending retirement and the recent sale of her home? I is she essentially flush with cash right now? Well, we assume she's got some cash. Uh, she did sell her home a few weeks ago. Uh, she had been talking about retiring for three or four months to her coworkers. Uh, and she had told them she was going to retire the 1st of May. She actually sent the paperwork up to the courthouse Thursday. Uh, to the personnel director, um, and then this happened Friday morning. So we assume she has access to some money, um, yet uh, I, we, we don't know for sure. Sheriff, how surprised are you about this? You, you, you knew this employee for 16 years. Are you shocked right now? I think we're all shocked in the sheriff's office. Uh, Vicki was an exemplary employee, 17 years. Uh, unblemished record, not a single negative thing in her personnel file. Uh, she was admired and respected by her co-workers and her subordinates. Uh, it's just been a total shock. The director said that Friday night at the detention center was like a wake at a funeral. Uh, everyone was so distraught over what had happened. What can you tell our viewers about Casey White? Obviously, he's armed and dangerous, and, and he's somebody who, looking at the different photos, is somebody who changes his appearance over the years. Um, I want to ask you do, you, do you know anything personally about him? And is he somebody who would have the power to manipulate one of your deputies like this? He certainly would be able to manip manipulate uh, a deputy or anyone else. Um, he has a long criminal history. I don't know that much about his personal background, but I do know that uh, he had some major issues back in 2015. The murder charge he was being tried on here also happened in 2015. Uh, that happened in Rogersville, Alabama, which is just about two or three miles from the Limestone County line. All the other crimes happened in Limestone County. So, um, you know, he, he's certainly a dangerous person. He's a big man, six foot nine, you know, you know 270 pounds or so. Uh, not someone, uh, you know, to be uh, messed with. So that's why we consider him extremely dangerous, because uh, he, he, he is a bad guy. They've been on the run for more than 72 hours. Do you have any confidence you're going to find them? Oh, we'll find him. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of when. 
Uh, my biggest concern is that, that somewhere out there there's going to be a law enforcement officer or more that encounters this guy. And uh, he's very dangerous. And, and I, I, every opportunity I have, I want to urge our brothers and sisters in blue, be very cautious. Don't take any chances with this guy. Uh, he's dangerous. He's already killed one person. He's wanted uh, you know, on these charges for capital murder. He's facing the death penalty. He has absolutely nothing to lose. And Sheriff, if, if by any chance Vicki White, your former employee, is watching this tonight, what, what's your message to her? You need to get back here and let's get this straightened out. Uh, you know how well respected you were by your peers and how you were admired and looked up to. Uh, you have really disappointed them. Uh, you need to get back and, and we need to get this straightened out. Lauderdale County Sheriff Rick Singleton, we thank you for joining Top Story tonight and good luck with your search on finding these two. Next tonight, a new round of storms taking aim as millions are in the path of the dangerous weather. Tornado warnings in effect in the Midwest as devastated parts of Kansas work to clean up the damage from two massive twisters that tore through nearly 1,000 structures. Morgan Chesky has the latest. Tonight, severe weather slamming the Midwest. Growing tornado on the ground right now. While down south, multiple reported tornadoes striking northwest Texas ripping roofs off buildings and flipping RVs. This after two twisters touched down in the Wichita, Kansas area over the weekend, wreaking Wichita havoc damage. on the Sunflower State. Oh my gosh. This shocking drone video capturing one of the quick moving funnel clouds as it obliterated home after home in its path. Massive amounts of debris launched skyward. The EF3 tornado generating devastating winds as high as 160 miles per hour. It went from a storm to severe thunderstorm warning to a tornado in minutes. Officials add at least four people were injured and up to a thousand buildings damaged. I got up this morning and I have no garage. All my tools are gone. And over resident Guy Quinn breaking down as he recalls the tornado closing in. His 11 year old daughter just down the street at a neighbor's home, but unreachable. It was, it's scary guys. It, uh, Really scary. The Quinn family all surviving without injury. Officials crediting early warnings with zero tornado deaths, but the weekend wasn't without tragedy. Beth and Alan Short say their son Gavin, a top meteorology student at the University of Oklahoma, called to say he was storm chasing Friday with two friends, Nicholas Nair and Drake Brooks. It's like a second family for him, and he was in the right place. He found his people. But as the group was driving back to campus, Authorities say their car hydroplaned, putting them directly in the path of a semi-truck. They were all watching each other's trackers, and they noticed that all three of their beacons had stopped moving. This is just the worst nightmare for us and two other sets of parents. Authorities say all three young men died at the scene. We want people to know that he was so good and so funny and so giving, and we love him so much. Morgan joins us tonight from Dallas. And Morgan, there's a terrible irony when we think about those young storm chasers because storm chasers are incredibly important in preventing tornado-related deaths, notifying the National Weather Service about what they're seeing in the field so the warnings can get out there faster to the community. In Kansas, officials saying those warnings did their job, but tragedy still struck when we talk about those three young men. Yeah, Tom, you're absolutely right. Those three young men that were leaving the storm zone lost their lives. But as for Andover, Kansas, officials say they have seen significant leaps in storm technology, storm warning technology, rather. And I should know that this twister struck almost 31 years to the day after another infamous tornado back in 1991 that left 17 people dead in that small Kansas town. Tom, the town's only tornado siren on that day in 91 was not operating. Since then, we have seen a night and day difference, and that is why officials in Andover, Kansas, say there were zero deaths as a result of this EF3 twister. Tom? Incredible. Nobody died in that tornado, but of course, our thoughts with the families of those three young storm chasers. We now turn to the growing wildfire danger in the West. In New Mexico, thousands have fled from their homes. Hundreds of structures destroyed. The state has at least 15 major fires burning, and wind gusts are only making things even worse. Miguel Almaguer has those details. 
The series of exploding out of control wildfires tearing across New Mexico is tonight poised to get even more destructive. Two fires merging into one monster blaze has alone torched over 100,000 acres. It's devastating. You don't know what's going to be there. With 65 mile an hour winds at its back and drought conditions in its path, nearly 300 structures are gone. Thousands fleeing the flames. We have nothing to go back to. As thick smoke smothers the Santa Fe region, whipping winds will again fan ferocious flames today. Some 4 million people in four states are under red flag warnings or fire watches. 50 mile an hour gusts fueling some of the 15 major blazes burning. The fire threat is dire. It is catastrophic. It is historic and we need to get out of harm's way. Still early in this disastrous fire season, so far over a million acres, the size of Rhode Island has gone up in smoke, twice as much land as this time last year. And with wind shifting, even more will be lost. We do have our lives and I am thankful to God for that. But I miss my home and it's just gone. Adding insult to injury, one of the two fires creating the largest in New Mexico was purposely set as a prescribed burn. But after kicking out of control, what firefighters were trying to prevent is exactly what they are now facing. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. All right, for more on the forecast, I want to bring in Bill Karens tonight. He joins Top Story by the Weather Board. Bill, the Midwest dealing with nonstop storms. We were talking so much about Kansas. I'm looking at your board right there. It looks like they're in the crosshairs again. Uh, Kansas all the way down through Oklahoma City. That's who the worst of the weather is. Not a tornado warning for Oklahoma City. We are under severe thunderstorm warning. They're saying two-inch possible hail. That's enough to break your windshield and put dents in your car. And also 70-mile-per-hour winds. That could take down trees and knock out Power. And that's happening now, sliding into Oklahoma with this bright pink and purple you see in the map. That's never good. Usually that's the sign of large hail coming through, very intense radar echoes. We do have one tornado warning to the south of that, but we haven't had any confirmed tornado warnings with that south south of Norman. We do have a tornado watch that continues all the way to Little Rock to 11 p.m. this evening. And that tornado watch for Oklahoma goes all the way up just south of Wichita until 10 p.m. this evening. So far, we've only had one report of one large tornado. That was just north of Morrison, and that's with this cell right here with that active tornado warning. But again, haven't heard of any destruction or anything like that. It was just a report in the last couple of minutes in from a storm tracker that there is a large tornado on the ground. And there are thunderstorms too in areas of Tennessee, but this will not be severe. And there is even a line of storms that goes all the way in the central Kansas now approaching Topeka. So the overnight hours, we're going to be watching this area from all the way into Tulsa. There will be more of a wind damage threat heading into Arkansas late tonight with isolated tornadoes. But right now is the biggest threat of any big tornadoes if we're going to have any. Tomorrow, just a slight risk. Tornado risk is lower for you. Cincinnati to Columbus, areas like Lexington and Louisville included in that. But then we do it all over again in the same areas that are getting hit right now on Wednesday. Another severe weather outbreak is possible right over the top of Oklahoma City all the way down the line. And I'll end with this, Tom. Not only did this storm bring severe weather, this is I-80 in Kimball, Nebraska. It was enough snow that they had to plow earlier today. Snow May in, 2nd. Snow in May. That is wild. <laughs> all right, Bill, we thank you for that. I'm sure we'll be checking in with you all week. We want to turn now overseas to the latest on the war in Ukraine. Dozens of civilians are fleeing the Mariupol steel plant after weeks of grim conditions, but many more are still trapped inside. Kelly Kobiea has more on the terrifying stories of the survivors and the uncertain future for those who are trying to escape. Their stories of survival inside this steel plant are harrowing. There were 40 of us, this woman says. We boiled two buckets of soup and that was our meal for the whole day. She's now made it out of the city. One of the roughly 100 civilians evacuated from the rubble of Mariupol's steel plant. All the time we were in the bunker, they were bombing. Olga Savina says. New satellite images show the plant, like most of the city, almost completely destroyed by Russian forces. The last Ukrainian soldiers holed up in the plant say more civilians are still trapped here. So this is it's around 20 children, we counted, and hundreds more adults, he says. But tonight it's still not clear where the evacuees, escorted by the UN and Red Cross staff, will end up. Russia says they were taken to Russian-controlled territory and that those who want to leave can. Ukraine's President Zelensky tonight says he warned the UN. The agreement with Russia is that these people can come to Ukrainian-controlled territory. Let's hope so, he says.
Meanwhile, Russian forces say they hit nearly 800 targets in Ukraine in 24 hours, including shipments of Western military aid. The shelling in Kharkiv, relentless. Valentina, like a medic in, in the city, right told me. We haven't safety. You don't have safety. Yeah, you may die at the next minute. <laughs> It's our life now. Though tonight, a senior U.S. military official describes the Russian progress in the eastern Donbass region as minimal. And tonight, Russia is facing outrage from Israel, the country demanding an apology after the Russian foreign minister appeared on Italian television saying Hitler was part Jewish. The Israeli foreign minister calling the comments unforgivable, scandalous, and a terrible historical error. And diplomats tell NBC News a Russian oil embargo could be announced as early as this week after Germany reversed its opposition. But importantly, that embargo would not include a ban on Russian gas. Tom? Kelly Kobier reporting in from eastern Ukraine tonight. Kelly, we thank you for that. To expand further on that last bit of reporting there from Kelly, that the European Union is preparing to unveil one of the most harshest economic penalties against Russia since the war with Ukraine began, a ban on the sale of Russian oil. I want to bring in the reporter who broke this news for NBC, Josh Letterman. Josh, thanks for joining Top Story tonight. So how soon can we expect the announcement and, and how much of an impact could it have on Russia? Well, diplomats tell us at NBC News that we could expect this announcement by the end of this week. And it certainly will have an impact on Russia. We've already seen uh, the mounting economic implications for Russia uh, of these European countries doing their best to wean themselves off of Russian energy. And in fact, in just the last couple of weeks, we've started to hear prominent Russian uh, business people and oligarchs actually complaining uh, about the effects that these sanctions and other economic measures are having. And so this will really be uh, the latest effort by Europe to try to turn the screw on Russia, increase that economic pressure. And frankly, it's a step that Ukraine specifically has been requesting of the Europeans for quite some time now. Josh, two more questions for you. To be clear, though, for our viewers, this is oil and not gas. Explain to our viewers how dependent Europe is on Russian gas. And then I got to say, Vladimir Putin's been playing hardball from the get-go. What's to say he doesn't cut off everything after hearing this news? Yeah, it's an important distinction because Europe is certainly more dependent on Russia for gas than it is for oil and for coal. And so uh, putting a embargo on Russian oil specifically, kind of the low-hanging fruit here, going after gas would certainly be much harder for countries that are reliant on it to heat their homes, to power their cars. And that's why we do expect uh, there to be a carve-out for gas uh, included in this embargo uh, from the European Union. Uh, and when it comes to the implications of this, particularly uh, if Russia were to try to retaliate, in fact, Russia's decision to start cutting Cutting off countries like Poland from their energy supply is one of the key reasons uh, that the European Union is now taking this step. They're saying, look, if Russia is going to use energy as a political weapon, then we have no choice uh, but to cut ourselves off from dependency uh, on Russian energy. And so uh, the European Union hoping that by taking this proactive step now, they are better able to shield their own economies from the possible consequences if Russia were to go farther uh, in trying to stop selling its energy products to countries in Europe that need it. All right, our Josh Letterman, who broke some big news tonight. Josh, we thank you for that. We want to turn now to Top Stories Money Talks, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. The Federal Reserve expected to raise interest rates this week in an effort to tame inflation. NBC's Tom Costello has more. In Salt Lake City, brothers Tyler and Dylan Green feel like the economy is stacked against them and their new company, Cash, that makes recreational accessories for tailgates. Supply chain delays in China, the high cost of business loans, and skyrocketing inflation are eating them alive. As a business owner, gaining more capital will cost us even more and make our margins that are already slim that much slimmer. And new loans are about to get even more expensive, with the Federal Reserve poised to raise rates by a half point this week after a quarter point hike in March. The Fed trying to knock down 40-year high inflation that Americans are feeling every day. We understand that high inflation imposes significant hardship, especially on those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. But the economy already shrank in the first quarter. The stock market higher today has been in a deep slide this year. This is one of the worst and most complex situations 
that the Federal Reserve could face because they are effectively trying to reduce demand without tipping over the economy. With higher interest rates making credit cards and loans more expensive, experts recommend consolidating your loans. If you're shopping for a new car or home, lock in your loan rate in the next 36 hours and maybe consider postponing that big purchase. I'd say this might not be the right time. The uncertainty is, would make me nervous to tell them to go ahead and make those large purchases. The Fed's challenge, hitting the brakes on the economy without sending it into recession. Meanwhile, diesel fuel prices have hit an all-time high, 532 a gallon. Analysts blame that on a shortage of refining capacity and the Russian oil embargo. Higher diesel costs mean higher shipping costs, which sends prices even higher for food and products across the board. Tom? Everything is going up. Okay, Tom Costello for us. Still ahead tonight, the verdict just reached in a case involving the Kardashians. Black China suing members of the famous reality TV family for damaging her character, the decision just handed down by a jury moments ago. Plus, actress Amber Heard fighting back in the defamation lawsuit filed against her by Johnny Depp. The drastic move she just took as she prepares to take the stand this week. And the black bear riding shotgun in a pickup truck. How police got in and cut that joyride short. Top story, just getting started on this Monday. Stay with me. Out of a brewing PR nightmare during Hollywood's biggest off-screen drama, actress Amber Heard firing her crisis management team just days before she said to take the stand in the $50 million defamation case brought by her ex Johnny Depp. His testimony drawing a tidal wave of support online, but Heard is still yet to speak out in the trial. Here's Maggie Vespa. Tonight, a mid-trial attempt at damage control in the defamation battle between two Hollywood stars. Actress Amber Heard firing her crisis management team. Sources familiar with the situation telling NBC News she expressed frustration with coverage of the trial, which may have favored her A-list ex-husband, Johnny Depp. When you hire a PR firm at this stage in the game, what you're saying is that you don't like how things have been going. The PR pivot coming after Depp wrapped his testimony last week in which his legal team played disturbing audio of the couple fighting with Depp defending some actions and denying others. But put your cigarettes out on someone else. You have consequences for your actions. That's it. Shut up. Um, I think that was another grossly exaggerated moment of Ms. Hurd's. I don't I did not put a cigarette out on her or throw a cigarette at her. Support mounting on social media with hashtags like justice for Johnny Depp and Johnny Depp is innocent. Now a change.org petition demanding Heard be dropped from her upcoming project, Aquaman 2, racking up hundreds of thousands of additional signatures over the weekend. Three weeks into this trial, do you see any hope of this new team, Amber Heard's new team, being able to turn the tide? I think it's going to be very difficult for Amber Heard's new team to turn the tide. Public relations is something that has to be invested in over the long haul. Depp is suing ex-wife Amber Heard for defamation after she wrote a 2018 op-ed in the Washington Post describing herself as a public figure representing domestic abuse. The article never names Depp, but his lawyers argue it clearly referenced the couple's marriage and dealt a major costly blow to his career. Pointing out after the piece was published, Depp was dropped from a $22.5 million deal to star in Pirates of the Caribbean 6. However, Disney has never stated Johnny Depp was dropped from the film due to the op-ed. Mr. Wiggum, between December 18, 2018, the date of the op-ed, and October 2020, did Mr. Depp perform in any studio films? Zero. No studio films. The actor seeking $50 million in damages. Heard, who's countersuing for $100 million, is expected to take the stand Wednesday. Her lawyers vowing to shift the focus to Depp, painting him as a, quote, monster who would abuse her while drunk and high. Heard has also denied abusing Depp. The question tonight, can a new PR team turn the tide in the court of public opinion? All right, Maggie Vespa joins us now live from Los Angeles. So, Maggie, back to Hertz firing her PR team. She'd been working with Precision Strategies. Now, it's a firm run by a former Obama deputy campaign manager. Suffice to say, a reputable firm. Same for her new one. What does she hope to gain from switching PR teams? 
Well, Tom, that's a great question. It's exactly the question our crisis management expert, who you heard from in that piece, said she would ask Amber Heard to start if she were on this new team, saying kind of, given the trial, given how dark this testimony has been, what does success look like to you in this scenario? And as you heard, that expert does not believe that any team could shift public perception of this trial quickly, if that is what Heard is hoping for. Tom. All right, Maggie Vespa for us. Maggie, we appreciate it. Coming up, the war on retail crime. The major chain is losing billions of dollars in revenue to organized crime rings. The corporate cops, they're now putting in stores across the country. Vicki Wynn in the house tonight on a top story to break down how it all works and who these corporate cops are. You're watching Top Story. Stay with us. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin tonight with a court victory for some members of the Kardashian Jenner family. A jury finding that Kim and Khloe Kardashian and Chris and Kylie Jenner did not harm Black China's career. The model had claimed they ruined her TV career after she broke up with former fiance Rob Kardashian. Jurors concluded there wasn't enough evidence to back up that claim. The Judds inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame last night, just one day after Naomi Judd's death. The Grammy winner's daughters, Winona and Ashley, accepted the honor on her behalf. On Saturday, the sisters posted on social media saying they lost their mother to, quote, the disease of mental illness. Naomi Judd was 76 years old. Next to what police are calling a deadly dog attack near Red Bay, Alabama. Officials there say a pack of dogs killed an Alabama Department of Public Health worker on Friday. Police say Jacqueline Summer Beard was responding to a report of another attack involving the same dogs and was trying to contact the dog's owner. The sheriff's officer says that owner has been charged with manslaughter now. And a wild car break-in in Cornwall, Connecticut. A man noticed the lights go on in his mother-in-law's car and saw this bear in the front seat. The animal apparently checked out his car for food first, then moved on to grandma's, ripping up the inside. An officer helped scare the bear off by firing a beanbag round but the man who spotted him thinks it'll be back. Make sure to lock those doors. All right, now to power and politics in the closely watched primary battle in the swing state of Ohio. Voters heading to the polls tomorrow after a push from high-profile Republicans, including President Trump, to influence the future of the party. NBC's Jesse Kirsch on the ground for us tonight. Tonight, Ohio's crowded Republican Senate primary down to the wire. A crucial race for the Buckeye State and former President Donald Trump, testing his perceived tight grip on the GOP. And now we may have to do it again. Teasing another presidential run in Nebraska Sunday, Trump also brought up the Ohio race. We've endorsed JP, right? J.D. Mandel, and he's doing great. One problem. Trump endorsed J.D. Vance, who's in a tight race with Josh Mandel, the former state treasurer. Well, I think President Trump gives probably thousands of words uh, of speeches every single week. Uh, he's going to misspeak every now and then, but the president is very much on board. Making his final pitch today, Vance, the front runner, surging in a recent Fox News poll after picking up the former president's coveted endorsement. This Senate primary is the question of what kind of Republican do we want to send to Washington, D.C.? But big name supporters haven't thinned the field. Josh Mandel is within the margin of error, and 25% of voters are still undecided, according to that Fox poll. If J.D. Vance is not successful next week, what does that say about the clout of Donald Trump and well, the Republican Well, I mean, Party? this is the campaign that's got the momentum, the energy, the enthusiasm. We don't want a circumstance where the establishment could claim that they defeated Trump. So President Trump's brand is on the line. The MAGA brand is on the line. But Mandel, who isn't backed by Trump, still ties himself to the former president, stumping with Texas Senator Ted Cruz. So the, the, the name Trump is much more than an endorsement for you in this campaign, it sounds like. Well, it's a governing philosophy. America first is a governing philosophy when it comes to the economy, when it comes to jobs in our state. At multiple campaign events and in the community, voters have repeatedly told us policy ideas matter more than endorsements. So you voted for Donald Trump twice. Why is his word not enough to just put you right in J.D. Vance camp? <laughs> well, he, he's kind of a wild card. You know, I'm not one, no, just because you've got these famous people in your corner doesn't mean that that's the right thing to do. You think Donald Trump's influence is on the line here in Ohio? I do, but I, I do. also think that these, these gentlemen and anyone running really needs to look at the, the reason why Trump was accepted by so many people, and that is putting America first. 
All right, Jesse joins us now from Columbus, Ohio. Jesse, so many watching this race to really see how much power former President Trump still has on the GOP. And Vance has had to answer questions for past comments he's made about Trump voters. How's that factoring into the final hours of this campaign? Because his opponent, Josh Mandel, wanted that endorsement, and a group of prominent Ohio Republicans asked the former president not to endorse Vance. Yeah, Tom, those past comments are still haunting Vance with less than 24 hours to go before voters head to the polls. At a Columbus area event today in particular, one woman asked Vance about his past comments, saying that he believed that some people voted for Trump for racist reasons. Those are comments from years ago. And Vance explained what he was talking about, saying that the broader context is that he did not think that is what was driving most Trump voters. Uh, but you could tell watching this woman and as she heard Vance's response, that it wasn't quite clicking for her and she wasn't fully satisfied. I caught up with her after the event and she did say she is going to vote for J.D. Vance, but that is as much to do, it seems, with uh, the former president's endorsement as well as that from other prominent conservatives. So for her, those endorsements helped make the difference. And she's not the only person that we have heard in recent days thinking about things that J.D. Vance has said in the past, things he's had to account for throughout this campaign. And so it is unclear at this point exactly how much of a difference that is going to make when voters go to the polls tomorrow, but it is certainly a factor. And at this point, it seems to be anyone's guess who will win this primary, Tom. All right, Jesse Kirsch on the campaign trail tonight for us. Jesse, thank you for that. And we're following some breaking news out of Tulsa right now. 101 years later, survivors and descendants of the Tulsa massacre are demanding justice. Zin Clay Esamwa has more from one of the only remaining survivors and the decision just made by a judge there. He was six months old when the Tulsa race massacre happened. Tonight, Hugh Van Ellis, or Uncle Red, is 101 and one of three survivors suing officials in Tulsa, Oklahoma, for one last chance at justice. I'm lucky to be here. Lucky to be alive to tell this story. I didn't want to say this. It's been in the inside of me for a long time. Tonight, winning a major victory, a judge ruling their reparations lawsuit will go to trial. Just a day before, supporters showed solidarity during a local prayer rally. Tulsa native Demario Solomon Simmons was there. He represents massacre survivors and descendants. What exactly are survivors asking for? We're basically stating very clearly that the massacre that happened in 1921 created a public nuisance. Plaintiffs claim the public nuisance caused negative outcomes for survivors and descendants. Now they're seeking multiple forms of restitution. One of the things we, we're asking for in our lawsuit is uh, educational scholarships and grants uh, because of the educational opportunity that was, that was stripped and stolen away. The 1921 Tulsa race massacre was sparked by a rumor that a black man, Dick Rowland, had sexually assaulted a white girl, Sarah Page. The official death toll was 37, but historians like Carlos Hill now say the attack on the Greenwood community by a white mob and officials likely led to 300 fatalities. The result, survivors say, generations of racial disparity, economic inequality, and trauma. My father, he managed to get us out of there on a horse in the way. We just, we just had to leave with just our night clothes on. In Uncle Red's case, he says the looting and destruction from the massacre forced his family to flee Tulsa, leaving them in financial ruin. Do you feel mm -hmm. like the massacre took away your chance for an education? The massacre took, took it away. That's what I feel. According to his lawyers, Uncle Red continues to live in poverty, adding his story is no anomaly. Over the decades, many black Tulsa survivors have spoken out, even testifying in favor of reparations in front of Congress. I was there when it happened. I'm still here. In response to the suit, defendants did not immediately reply for comment. Some filed motions to dismiss the case, claiming plaintiffs' alleged injuries could not be remedied by the courts. Meanwhile, Tulsa's current mayor, G.T. Bynum, appointed a public oversight committee to investigate mass graves from the massacre. And while the survivors await their trial date, it hasn't stopped the community from organizing. And why now? We need to do it right now. It's time. It's time. It's been a hundred years. All right, with that, Zinclay joins us now live. So Zinclay, we know that this lawsuit can move forward now. What are the next steps? 
Tom, that's right. The lawsuit can move forward. And I actually just spoke with the legal team for the survivors and descendants, and they emphasize that this is incredibly historic. They add that the judge will issue a detailed ruling soon, so they're not sure on what grounds the suit will move forward. But the bottom line, Tom, is that they will have their opportunity for a day in court, which, after over 100 years, is certainly something the survivors are celebrating tonight, Tom. Yeah, Zinclay Esamal with that breaking news. Zinclay, thank you for that. And now, the, now to the war on organized retail crime. A sophisticated network of shoplifters raking in billions of dollars in stolen goods. Not only is it leading to higher consumer costs, but it's also putting lives at risk. Vicki Wynn has more on how retailers are fighting back. This may look like a disorganized dash, men running out of a pharmacy with bags of over-the-counter products. But police say this is a professional crew connected to a six-state crime spree. Retailers estimate organized retail crime cost them $68 billion in 2019. Such a growing problem. Chains like Walmart, Target, Home Depot and others employ teams of so-called corporate cops. They work with actual cops and federal agents to gather intel and even surveil suspects. Recording undercover video like this. Two women moving stolen baby formula in Florida. And these photos evidence in a federal case against an Atlanta man sentenced to nearly six years in prison for selling millions worth of stolen products online. At least half a dozen states have set up task forces that include corporate cops. The idea? Build bulletproof cases and share information with prosecutors to go after crime rings. These are professional thieves. They're going to steal fifty to $60,000 a day. Ben Dugan leads the corporate investigations team for CVS. He says they go after big fish connected to crime rings worth a million dollars or more. It's an, an organized retail crime epidemic. And it's threatening the safety of, of employees, the safety of customers, the profitability and uh, sustainability of businesses across all of retail. These thieves steal everything from cold medicine to power tools, even high-end goods, all of it quickly and profitably resold in online marketplaces where it's hard to track down sellers. I think the average consumer doesn't think of it on the same level as the mafia or a drug cartel. Right. Do you? Absolutely, 100%. Um, they, this money is used to buy weapons. Uh, this money is used to do the same thing that narcotics money is used to, to do. NYPD Captain Tariq Shepard leads the Metro Organized Retail Crime Alliance, a network of stores, law enforcement, and local prosecutors who share data across three states. What do you say to people who say, well, this is a victimless crime? Uh, absolutely not. There's a lot of dangers in it. He points to stolen items like diabetic test strips or baby formula that can be harmful if improperly stored and resold on the black market. There's so many different type of products in which buying stolen merchandise could be dangerous to the consumer. But also, anytime you have a high volume of theft like this, the retailers have to make that up. All right, Vicky joins us on set now. So, Vicky, it's sort of a fine line with these corporate cops, right? The stores clearly need them because these retail thefts are out of control. But at the same time, they're not real police officers. They're not. And some legal experts say corporate cops might overstep their powers. Unlike a sworn police officer, Tom, a corporate cop or retail investigator, they can come up and start questioning you. And the fear is you might say something that's incriminating that prosecutors could later hold against you in court. Time now for Top Stories Global Watch and another survivor being pulled out alive from the rubble of a building collapse in China. You can see medical workers taking that person to an ambulance Monday. The building collapsed Friday. So far, eight people have been saved. Officials say dozens of others are either trapped or missing. State media says police have arrested several people in connection to this disaster. Next to New Zealand, where it's reopening its borders to foreign tourists from more than 50 countries for the first time since dropping most of its pandemic restrictions. Families reuniting at Auckland Airport, some after two years apart. Maori cultural performers greeting the travelers in arrivals. Tourists will still need to be vaccinated and test themselves before and after arriving. And many Muslims are celebrating Eid al-Fitr today. It marks the end of Ramadan, Islam's holiest month. It means festival of breaking the fast. People celebrate by gathering at mosques praying and feasting with family and friends. Finally tonight, an older sister surprise. A U.S. Army specialist coming home for the first time in years. But with eight younger siblings, surprising them all in one day became an off-duty mission she couldn't wait to complete. It's been nearly two years since U.S. Army specialist Trinity O'Brien has seen her eight younger siblings. Maculay, Declan, Nolan, Sean, Claire, Liam, Felicity, Aiden, Trinity. She's been stationed in Germany serving as a military police officer. I'm so excited. 
First up, surprising Liam and Felicity during lunch at Henry Ford II High School. Next up, Trinity interrupting an English class at Bemis Junior High, surprising Claire. She's supposed to be in Germany. Wow. <laughs> All of these surprises set up with the help of administrators at the Utica School District. He's going to come out. He has no idea you're coming. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited. Next up, surprising the four youngest O'Briens at Browning Elementary School. Mom and dad happy not just to have their oldest home, but to have the whole family under one roof again. It's so neat to see all my kids together in one spot and all under, you know, with us here today. And I'm just, I couldn't be happier. I was just emotional. I mean, we just really missed Trinity. So it was, it was wonderful to see our kids kind of just be able to have that moment with her. Want to go get our nails done? Yeah. Go bowling? Yeah. yeah. One big family together at last. It's amazing. I wouldn't trade it for the world. <laughs> So glad she's back home. We want to thank our Detroit station, WDIV, for their help on that story. And we want to thank the O'Brien family for also sharing all those great moments. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.